All right, Revelation chapter 16, verse 13. Revelation 16, 13 is where we're going to begin. We left off last week by looking at Revelation chapter 15, a short chapter, and then the first half of chapter 16, uh, both of which concerned the build-up to and the beginning of the pouring out of these vials, the King James says, these bowls, shallow basin-like uh, containers that held um, incense fragments in it, which would be burned, and the incense would, would uh, swirl around and provide a, a pleasant aroma. Uh, well, this was a, uh, a special kind of incense. This is an apocalyptic kind of incense. This is the kind of incense that, in the context of Revelation chapter 15 and the first half of 16 in particular, uh, is representational of God's uh, judgment against Rome and God pouring out his wrath against Rome. <clears throat> and as we go through the first half of chapter 16, what we saw was, as I say, there are seven of them, seven of these bowls, seven angels tasked with pouring out the, the power that is within these bowls. And each one that is poured out coincides with a, a particular direct attack by God against the uh, Roman Empire. Uh, whether that's an indirect attack, he's, he's attacking the nature of, uh, the elements of the world, and that hurts Rome or is hurting Rome directly. One way or another, Rome is the negative recipient of these various um, uh, vials of judgment being poured out. And as we come to chapter 16, verse 13, where we're at is six of these have already been poured out, and the seventh one is yet to come. And as we've noticed throughout this book, whenever there is a list of seven and seven things have to happen, it tends to be the case, this was the, the, the case most recently with the seven trumpets, that after the sixth of them, before the seventh, there is a gap. There is some kind of a delay, some kind of a pause in between the sixth and the seventh. Whereas the first six happen in pretty quick succession, and the way that John writes about them is almost one action per verse. Um, this happened in this verse, and the next verse, this happens, in the next verse, it happens a third time. But then once you get after number six, there's a several verse period where a lot of things are talked about. And it's because seven is, in Revelation, a number that represents completion, wholeness, totality. And so once the seventh one is done, whatever it is, you're, you're finishing it, you're wrapping it up, you're doing the end of it. <clears throat> and so it is, it is understandable why you would have these um, pauses before the last one is done, just to kind of make sure all the pieces are in place and everything is explained and everyone understands what's happening. Uh, and so there's that gap and then number seven. And that's what we see here once again. Uh, vial after vial, bowl after bowl, incense after incense is poured out throughout this chapter 16. One, two, three, four, five, six, and then a pause. And what we see here at the beginning of chapter, uh, the beginning of the text, we're about to start, verse 13, is almost like the response of it from the side of evil. What can Rome do against God? What can Rome do to counteract what God has done and is doing to them? Well, actually, there's not much they can do except complain and gripe or potentially repent, but they don't seem to want to do that. They don't want to repent. They're fine with complaining and griping, and as we'll see in the text, blaspheming, but repenting and changing, that's <coughs> not going to happen. And that kind of that idea is kind of illustrated for us. The, the um, doubling down in sinfulness, <coughs> excuse me, the doubling down in sinfulness that uh, you see with the stubborn-hearted evil people of the world is what we see in the beginning of our text. Revelation 16, verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Three, um, three of the primary evil characters that we've been reading about for so many chapters now. The dragon is the devil, the beast is the emperor, and the false prophet is the Roman um, state priest who facilitates and orchestrates and oversees the worship of the emperor. Domitian, in particular, at this time period, demanded to be worshipped as God. And so the priests of Rome went out into those temples and into the, the places of worship, and they made sure that the people of Rome paid homage to the emperor as a god. And if you did, then you're, you're fine. You can live and work and function uh, in society. If you refused to bow down to Caesar, then you were denied access to provisions. You couldn't buy or sell or anything. Um, and so it was those priests who handled that worship of the beast 
the beast who is just a, an instrument of, the, of evil by the devil above him. But why frogs? Again, the text, I saw three unclean spirits, and it doesn't say they were frogs. It says they were like frogs coming out of the mouths of these three beings. Why, why of all words to choose, does he choose frogs? Does he mean that it's a creature that resembled a frog in some way? Is it something that's hopping? I don't think so. <clears throat> I think frog is used in particular because frog is an unclean animal. And I think what you're seeing is a, a kind of a summation of what the response of evil is to God's punishment of evil. <clears throat> what is their response? It is to spew from their mouth unclean things. To spew out of their mouth something like frogs, something like an unclean animal, Leviticus 11. You can't eat a frog or you'll be considered unclean. And so they're spewing out frogs. They're spewing out uncleanness. They're vomiting forth their, their blasphemy against God. That's the response of evil in this text. God has sucker punched. Well, not sucker punched. That sounds like God's the bad guy. God has landed a knockout blow six times in a row. And six times Rome has refused to repent, say they're sorry, and change. And instead they blasphemed, they've cursed, they've assaulted. Let's read a little bit more about these, these unclean things. Verse 14. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the <coughs> excuse me, kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. First of all, they are the spirits of devils working miracles. But these are not true prophets. These are not real miracle workers. These are false prophets. These are pretenders. These are people doing the work of the devil, the liar. These are like the, um, the magi of Pharaoh's court who could turn their staffs into snakes and vice versa um, and make, make their snakes rigid to, to appear to be a staff to fool people and to think they could make a transformation. And then they were exposed by Moses, who could work an actual miracle. And so they're like that. They're pretend worshipers. They're oh, pretend uh, miracle workers, I should say. They're pretend magi. They're working their phony miracles. And they go forth unto the kings of the earth and the whole world, working these phony miracles, convincing and tricking and deceiving everyone else in the world. That's a theme that's going to come into play later in this chapter, in particular in the next chapter. Um, mostly in the next chapter, as we look at what the world's response is going to be to the Roman Empire's collapse. And all of these kings that had all their hands in the Roman cookie jar, how they're going to lament and wail and be completely apoplectic over what's going to happen to their sugar daddy, the Roman Empire. So take that phrase, the kings of the earth and the world, and just kind of set that aside. That's just a seed that John is planting here. He'll, he'll water it in the next chapter. But also to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. And if you can peek ahead in your Bible, if you're reading ahead, you see that we're building in a couple of verses to the reference to Armageddon, the great battle of Armageddon, as the Revelation talks about it, which is so overblown and so misunderstood and so over-exaggerated that the whole point of it is completely missed. But we'll get there in just a second. Either way, what John is describing is this, this um, uh, marshalling of forces, this um, corralling of their side to prepare for some great battle against God's people. What kind of battle? What does it look like? What's the nature of it? We'll talk about in a minute. Verse 15. Out of nowhere, just out of the blue, Jesus speaks. And this is, unless I'm mistaken, unless I missed a text here or there, this is the first time we hear Jesus speak since chapter 3 of Revelation. Throughout this, we've heard, we've heard the voice of God. We've heard the big, booming voice of the king on the throne. We've seen the lamb, and we've seen Jesus in various forms. But since John was called up into the vision of chapter 4 starting, it has been either just the generic, for lack of a better word, voice of God, and not particular Jesus, or it has been uh, clearly identified as the voice of God the Father, or it's been an angel speaking, or... It's been John himself writing. But Jesus now speaks. And there's no introduction. There's no setup. He just randomly starts talking. You would think John would say, and then I looked, and I saw Jesus, and he said unto me. No. It's just you have in the previous couple of verses, what it says in verse 13 and 14, you have 
uh, the vomiting out of these unclean things, and they're going out, preparing for the great battle, and then suddenly, behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. What kind of shame? The kind of shame that comes not from being disrobed physically, but the kind of shame that comes from being not wearing the proper spiritual clothing. Blessed is he that is wearing his garments of white, his, his blood-cleansed robes. Revelation chapter 7, verse 14. Blessed is he that is dressed for the occasion. What occasion? In this context, the great battle that is coming. But it's important to be dressed for this battle, and the kind of dress that you wear in this battle is not armor, but is robes of pure white. Make sure that you're dressed for the occasion. Make sure you're not shameful. Make sure that you're not unprepared by being undressed. But at the beginning of this verse, Jesus says words which we've heard before and associated with Jesus in a different context. He says, Behold, I come as a thief. Now this is not, despite the way it is often phrased, this is not a second coming text. Jesus is not saying, I'm about to return for judgment day of the world. I'm about to return, at which point there will be no more time, there will be no more earth, it will be the end of all things, and the righteous will go into eternal bliss, and the condemned will go to eternal condemnation. Behold, I'm coming as a thief. That is an expression that is used in the Bible to describe the second coming. Yes, Peter uses it in 2 Peter 3, that the Lord will come like a thief in the night. But that is not the only time that expression is used, or that's not the only way that expression is used to describe the second coming. It is used any time you want to say something that is surprising, sudden, unexpected. A thief does not tell you when he's going to break in. He comes like a thief does, which is to say, surprisingly, shockingly, randomly, or randomly from our perspective, the thief planned it out. But just all of a sudden, the thief is here, and we were not prepared for it. Anytime you want to convey that idea, you use that expression, come as a thief, and that's what Jesus says here. Blessed is he that watches, blessed is he that is keeping a lookout, blessed is he that is prepared, wearing his garments, not found naked and ashamed. So what's he talking about if not the second coming? First of all, I know it's not the second coming, because as we go through this text, it's described for us that after it happens, in this context, after it happens, the enemies of God who are going to suffer as a result of it will respond by blaspheming God and by cursing God. They're going to stay on earth and wag their fists at God who just punished them. But if the punishment we're talking about is the second coming, they're not going to do that. Because at the second coming, the earth is going to be destroyed. And the enemies of God are going to be sent away from God, out of his sight and presence forevermore. So that's not this. This is a limited, smaller in scope punishment. It is a specific targeting of a nation. And it just so happens that throughout the Bible, one of, the, one of the common expressions used to describe God bringing judgment against a nation is the coming of the Lord. For example, in Deuteronomy 33, verse 2, Moses describes God's punishment against Egypt as he prepared the Exodus as the coming of the Lord. It, that's not the second coming. And yet, that's exactly how Moses describes it, the coming of the Lord. Jude describes God's punishment against evil nations as the coming of the Lord. Jesus describes God's punishment against Jerusalem by the Roman Empire in the year 70 as the coming of the Lord, Matthew 24. Throughout the book of, of uh, Jeremiah and Isaiah, the phrase, the coming of the Lord, is used to describe God's punishment against a nation. Same idea here. It is not the second coming. It is about punishment against the Roman Empire and how that punishment will be sudden and unexpected. Verse 16. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Armageddon. One of those big words that we know. I-R-M-A-G-A-D-D-O-N. It doesn't matter. Um, G-E-D-D-O-N. It's one of those uh, 
terms from the book of Revelation that's kind of transcended the book. It's like the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Everyone knows the four horsemen of the apocalypse, even if they don't know the reference, and they certainly don't know what it's about. It's Revelation chapter 6, and it's about the, the journey of a Christian in the world. But you don't, you don't see that unless you look at it through the prism of the book of Revelation and the lessons it's trying to teach. Well, this is another one, Armageddon. People look at Armageddon, and they expect it to be describing some grand battle. And I know that's how it's, it's called a battle in Revelation. But you have to remember, Revelation is written in metaphorical terminology. Revelation is written in apocalyptic literature style, which means it uses symbols and it uses terms and words that may be rooted in natural things, worldly things, to describe holy things or spiritual things or things that exist in the ethereal plane. And so here you have the battle of Armageddon. Well, what is Armageddon? I know that if you go to YouTube or if you just search in Google, if you just ask random commentators and, and so-called scholars and Bible teachers, and I'm talking about the, the quacks and the nuts on the, the Trinity Broadcasting Network, those kinds of people who see nothing but premillennialism when they look at their Bible, they'll tell you that Armageddon refers to some, some grand holy battle between the forces of good and the forces of evil. And we'll take part in it, and the Satan's people will take part in it. It'll be this grand battle like the Battle of Pelennor Fields at the end of Lord of the Rings. That is not how it goes. That's not how the Bible works. That's not how the spiritual warfare works. Why, does God in, why would God need to do that? Why would God need to rally an army to fight with swords and shields or muskets and cannon? Why would God need to do that? If God wants you dead, you're dead. He doesn't need to load a musket. If God wants to kill you, he'll just, you'll just be dead. He doesn't even have to wink at you. He doesn't even have to make a finger gun. If he wants you dead, you're just already dead. It must not be a physical battle because nothing in this book, well, I shouldn't say nothing, very little of this book is, is meant to be taken in a physical, literal way. It's supposed to be representational. And sometimes it is a representation uh, a spiritual application from a representation that can't even exist in the physical world. Do you remember several chapters ago when we, uh, we came upon a listing of the tribes of Israel? And it was, it was in Revelation. And it was describing this is who God's people are. They're the tribe of uh, Dan. They're the tribe of Benjamin. They're the tribe of Asher. They're the tribe of Manasseh. Or the tribe of Ephraim, whatever. And it gives you the whole long list of them. Except it doesn't include Levi. And it doesn't include um, Manasseh, I think. But it, it does include um, Joseph. So why would it include Joseph and Ephraim, the son of Joseph? Why not, not include Joseph and include Manasseh and Ephraim, the sons? And why, why not include Levi? And it was one of those things where no matter which way you try to arrange it, no matter how you try to figure it out, you're always going to be lo losing one tribe that should be there. You're missing one or you're adding two. It just it never made sense because you're not supposed to take it literally. You're not supposed to read it as an actual listing of the actual tribes of Israel. It's metaphorical. It's representational of God's people, which is the church today. Same thing here. Armageddon is a compound of two Hebrew words. Ar and Mageddon. Ar from the Hebrew word har. Mageddon from the Hebrew word Megadon. But Har is the Hebrew word for mountain. Megadon is just an approximation of the word Megiddo. So it is mountain or mountains of Megiddo. All the word Armageddon means is mountains of Megiddo. Here's the problem. Bible map, okay? Bible map is easy to draw. The Holy Lands, I mean. You just have to draw this little, uh, little, little um, notch here. That's Mount Carmel. Swing it down. This is Egypt, Nile River. And then you have this little circle here. That's the Sea of Galilee, Dead Sea, and then um, Jordan River in between. So you got Mount Carmel here. You've got Mount Tabor and Mount Moriah down here where Jerusalem is. You've got Mount Gerizim over here in the land of the Samaritans. You've got all these mountains everywhere, all these mountains. Where is Megiddo? Megiddo is about here or so, a little bit to the west of the Sea of Galilee. That's Megiddo, also known as 
Are you ready for this? The plains of Megiddo. The plains of Megiddo. Because even though there are mountains all around down here and over here and up there, in actual Megiddo, it's as flat as a pancake. It's as flat as Kansas on a hot summer day. There are no mountains of Megiddo. Our Megiddo does not exist in a physical world. And that is something that eludes so many so-called Bible students and so-called Bible teachers who you look them up on YouTube and you just type in Battle of Armageddon, you'll get hundreds of hits, hundreds of videos with titles similar, similarly to um, Battle of Armageddon site or Battle of Armageddon location. And it's always some guy with wild and crazy hair and he's looking over some vast place. And a lot of them go to what is the, the remains of the excavated remains of Megiddo. And it's just plains. It's just flat area all around. And yet they're looking for the mountains of this place. The mountains of this place don't exist. It's like saying the swamps of Canada. There are no swamps in Canada. It doesn't make any sense. Because you're not supposed to read this word and think literal. You're not supposed to read this word and think earthly. This word is supposed to represent something. God is going to have this grand battle in his mountains. What is the mountain of God? What is the mountain of God? The mountain of God is not a physical, you know, um, rising of tectonic plates or anything like that. The mountain of God is the church of Jesus Christ, Isaiah chapter 2. The grand battle of Armageddon is nothing more than the battle for your soul. What Armageddon is describing is the battle between good and evil. Listen, the war, the war between God and Satan has already been won. The war is over. The war was over on Resurrection Sunday morning when the angel said, He's not here. He is risen. Come see where his body used to be and is not any longer. Jesus is risen. He conquered sin. He conquered death. He defeated the two weapons that the devil has. The only reason the devil could win the war was because of sin and death, and Jesus defeated both, sin on the cross and death from the grave. So the war is over, but the battles still rage, and there's precedent for that in history. Wars are ended with treaty, and the war doesn't reach the, the front lines as battles still fight. The, the War of 1812 between America and Great Britain was ended at the Treaty of Ghent, but they didn't get the message down in uh, Louisiana, and so Alexander Jackson continued fighting, and he led the Union Army to a, to, a, to a win against Great Britain in the Battle of New Orleans. And even though we technically lost the War of 1812, we, we, we signed the treaty to get them to leave us alone, even though we lost the war, we won that last battle, and so we basically walked away saying, we'll call it a draw. You know, we lost the war of 1812, but because we won throughout Andrew Jackson and the Battle of New Orleans, because we won that battle, the final battle, we walked away saying, no, that's about even, that's fair. We'll just say we both won and call it a day. You may win the battle, or you may win the war and lose the battle. Jesus has won the war, but the battle still rages in the battlefield of your soul. You are the plain of Megiddo. You are the mountain of God today. You're your own little mountain where Satan has rallied his forces and God has rallied his forces and it's good versus evil to fight for your soul. The devil has lost but he's taking people with him on his way down and I might be one of them and you might be one of them if we surrender and if we give up. Keep reading. Verse 17. The seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. Not, I should point out, not it is finished. This is not finished. Finished is teleo in the Greek. This is it is done. Genomai in the Greek. So again, look at the beginning of the verse. The seventh angel. We've had six angels with six bowls of incense full of judgment. Poured out one after another after another. And now a big gap as we built up to this moment when the seventh angel is going to do his work. 
And now he's doing it. He pours out his vial, and he pours his out into the air, into the atmosphere, into the heavens above the, the Roman Empire. What's going to happen? Well, we're not told yet. But whatever happens is going to revolve around atmosphere, weather. We'll see that in a few verses. But he pours his vial out into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne. Who speaks from the throne? The king, God. The voice of God booms from the throne in the temple in the heavenly domain where John is kind of witnessing all of this happen. And he's, he's stooping down to see earth below and the angel pouring out his vial and then he hears the voice from the throne and the voice of God says, it is done. And what does that mean it is done? On the cross, Jesus, as he was about to die, utters three powerful words, it is finished. But that's not this. It is finished, teleo, means it is, it is completed. It is a passive kind of word. It's essentially Jesus saying, I have allowed it to happen. And I know if you, if you track the journey of Jesus to the cross, you can find numerous instances where he took a direct action, where he directly involved himself in that process. But at the end of the day, Jesus is on the cross because evil people did evil things. And as he famously says, I could have called 12 legions of angels. I could have allowed myself to be freed, but I chose not to. I instead allowed myself to be killed. That's Jesus on the cross. It is allowed to happen. It is finished. Passive. This word in Revelation is God after the seventh angel pours out his, his punishment. The voice of God says, it is genomai. Genomai means molded into existence. It has been created by me. I have made, actively made this happen. Had God not intervened, Rome would still be standing. Instead, God says, I rose this empire up and I will bring this empire down. As I did to the Macedonians before them, as I did to the Medo-Persians before them, as I did to the Babylonians before them, over and over throughout history, God raises up empires and topples empires, brings up kingdoms and destroys kingdoms, elevates kings and destroys kings. I made this happen. It is done. And it all happens so fast that God utters these words as soon as the angel pours out his vial, but before it even affects the world below. Instantaneously, God says, that's it. I caused this. What you're about to see, credit goes to me. Verse 18. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings and a great earthquake, such as was not seen since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. You've never seen an earthquake like this before or felt one, John says. And obviously this is not hyperbolic, this is John um, speaking metaphorically because he is not on the earth right now. I, in the vision, he is in the, the throne setting of God. He is surrounded by the angels and the, the four angelic beasts and all the elders, and the throne is before him. So the ground under his feet to quake. But this is his way of describing in apocalyptic literature the stirring of God, the action of God. God's about to move and spring into being and spring into action. And how do you describe that? But saying, there was this sound all around me, and there was thunder and lightning, and everything around me was shaking and trembling because the almighty God is about to do something, even though he just said, I've already done it. God is so fast, he says it before he does it. His voice is faster than his hand. I have done it as he's doing it. And as he's doing it, John feels the tremble of the world, of all creation around him. Verse 19. And the great city, Rome, was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. I love the end of that verse, but look at the beginning of it first. Verse 19. The great city, Rome, was falling in pieces. A third here, a third there, a third there. By thirds, it is just, it's falling in chunks. And the cities of the nations, all the cities around the city of Rome, all the, the, the backbone of the empire, 
falling as well. And great Babylon. What Babylon? Not old Babylon. Metaphorical Babylon, Rome. Came in remembrance before God. Listen, God does not forget. God has never forgotten anything. His mind always knows everything at all times. So whenever you read in your Bible that God remembered something or that God brought something to mind, all that means is God has always had this plan in place. And he has just let things fester and let things stew and let things kind of work around his planning until the moment came when it was time to do what he was going to do. And when that moment came, God says, all right, it's time to bring you to the front. It's time to move you to the front of the line to do what we're going to do. It's like God, it's not, it's not like we think of the word remembrance. It's more like a teacher calling on a student. God brought Babylon to the front of the class. Babylon, it's your turn. God has called Babylon to mind. He says, now you come before me to take your punishment. Spiritual Babylon, Rome. And how does it describe it? In the King James, it says, in remembrance before God, to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Throughout this book, at least for the past couple of chapters, we've been reading about how God's wrath has been filling up slowly and slowly and slowly. With every transgression, with every crime, with every sin, botched action by the Roman Empire, the cup of the wine of God's wrath has been slowly reaching the top, and it's going to foam over. And now that it has reached the top, God has taken the cup of his wrath and he is shaking the hand of Rome. Now you're going to drink the wine of my rage. The cup of the fierceness, the unresistible, unstoppable, irresistible, ungetaroundable punishment, wrath of God. Verse 20. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. Where are you going to go when God sets his eyes of judgment against you? When God's angry, fierce, indignated eyes, when they turn to you and they're about to punish you, your first inclination may be to look around for a good place to hide. Unfortunately for Rome, they might try to flee. They're on a peninsula, the Italian peninsula, the Apennine Peninsula. They might try to flee, but it says all the islands fled away from them. We don't want you here. We're out of here. All the islands fled from the seas, so they could not hide there. Well, then we'll go into the mountains. There are mountains all to the north. We'll go into the mountains. No, the mountains cannot be found either. You will find no refuge anywhere in the world when God puts his eyes on you. That's kind of the theme of the book of Obadiah. As the prophet Obadiah is riding to the kingdom of Edom, who had uh, stabbed Israel in the back and had uh, sided with Israel's enemies against her. And Obadiah writes for God, and he says, You people in, in Edom, you people who have hi- hidden in your, your rocky territory, thinking you can hide in the crevices and in the caves of your mountains. No, you can't hide from God. Your mountains will not protect you. Well, that's the message to Rome. You want to flee to the islands? The islands have already ran away. You want to flee to the mountains? The mountains are hidden from you. You cannot go anywhere. To escape what's coming. Verse 21. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven. Remember a couple of verses ago. The angel pours out his vial into the air. Into the atmosphere. And it stirs up a hailstorm. And the hail falls every stone about the weight of a talent. Between 60 and 100 pound. Between 60 and 100 pound. Bowling balls of ice. Falling from the sky. And what's the response of the evildoers? Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail. For the plague thereof was exceeding great. What is the response of Rome? This is their last gasp. Seven judgments made against them. Seven punishments leveled against them. Seven times God has punched and punched and punched and punched. And seven times they've responded, not with apology, not with changing their actions, but with blasphemy. And that's it. Thus ends the Roman Empire. And as you open to chapter 17, you get the eulogy. You get the obituary. Here lies Rome. What do we say about her? That's chapter 17. 
Now, the Christian reading this is still in the midst of Roman persecution. The empire is still breathing down their, their necks, still putting their boot to their throats. The empire is still a threat, but what they're reading here, these Christians reading this text for the first time, they're reading the promise of God. This is what will happen. And when it's all over, we'll get the obituary for Rome. Chapter 17. There came one of the seven angels who had the seven vials. Which one? Don't know. Moving on. And talked with me, saying unto me, Come here. I will show unto you the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters. It's very pointed. John has witnessed this angel pour out his vial. And he saw these hail, hail, this uh, hailstorm of, of bowling balls crash into the ground. And he's seen the Roman Empire be reduced to, to debris as a result. And as he's watching the spectacle, an angel comes to him and says, hey, you want a better look? Let's, let's, let's get a little higher, see a bigger viewpoint. Come up with me. I'll show you the judgment of Rome. I'll show you all that God has done, or from the perspective of the reader, will do to the Roman Empire. And how does he describe the Roman Empire? He calls her the great whore that sits upon many waters. Called a whore or a harlot in your translation because of the relationship she's going to be illustrated as having with various other kings of the world, kingdoms of the world. She sits upon many waters because I think <coughs> it is the, the, the usage of water in this book is kind of murky and mysterious as you first start it. But as you progress through it, the book, I think it becomes clear that the sea and many waters describe the nations of the world. And that is the apocalyptic equivalent of the kingdoms of earth. And I, it's not so obvious at the beginning, but it becomes more focused and obvious toward the middle and end. And then especially at the end, when you read, there was no more sea, and we'll see that at the end of this book. But here, I think it's starting to come into focus that these seas represent the kingdoms and how the Roman Empire had her toes in all these different waters. She had her tentacles, the hydra's tentacles, and all these different bodies of water represented by the kingdoms or representing the kingdoms. Rome was a huge, sprawling empire, but she wasn't the empire of Earth. She was a huge geographical force that had alliances and deals and treaties with all these other kingdoms around her because all these other kingdoms around her could not compete. She was so much bigger. So much more powerful. So all they could do was just play nice and make deals with them. And so that relationship is described for you in the first part of this chapter as a harlot with her suitors. All right? Verse 2, about Rome, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication. That's why she's called a whore. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So she has struck all these trees and struck all these deals with all these empires, or all these kingdoms. But in response, what these other kingdoms had to do was capitulate to Rome's debauchery and Rome's evil. Now listen, Rome is an empire credited with many great advancements in society. Modern, modern equivalents to, to indoor plumbing and aqueducts and um, just um, sewage treatments in general and roads. All those kind of things that we attribute to the Roman Empire. I mean, state-level roads that, that stretch across an entire domain. All these things we credit to Rome. We also have to credit to Rome a society of debauchery and wickedness and evil and murder and the punishment of the innocent. All those things are also credited to Rome. And so while it's easy to say all these kingdoms just wanted to have good plumbing, yeah, but they had to bow the knee, bend the knee, to an empire that slaughtered the innocent en masse. And so that kind of getting in bed with the enemy, that's the metaphor John uses here, or the angel uses to John. Rome is a harlot, and all these kingdoms are just Johns that get with her. Verse 3. So the angel carried me away, John says, in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. We have already met a scarlet-colored beast, a red beast, that had seven heads and ten horns. That's the great beast dragon from chapter 12. So we've already been introduced to this concept. It's just added to that is the idea 
of the Roman Empire being this woman sitting on the beast. Not riding the beast like uh, the cowboy rides the horse and the cowboy's in charge and the horse serves the cowboy. No, in this case, it's, it's more like the, the beast has to carry around the woman who is riding um, on its back. The beast is supporting her. The beast is carrying her. The beast is the one in charge. The beast is leading her. The beast is the devil. The Roman Empire is the woman. The devil's in charge here. All of his heads and all of his horns. Verse 4. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Hang on just a second. Go back a verse to verse 3. I forgot to mention that as he is describing the beast, he says, I saw this scarlet-colored beast full of the names of blasphemy. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. What do you have to see in order to describe it as, I saw this thing that was full of the names of blasphemy? What did John see that would make him say it was full of names of blasphemy? I, I can't even visualize that. And it leads me to believe, as I, as I start to understand how this book was written and why it was written the way it was, is that a lot of this book is, is, yeah, things that John saw and he describes for us. And a lot of it is things that he, <coughs> he could not put into words, <coughs> excuse me, to describe it in a descriptive way, like you would say it was blue and six feet tall and 300 pounds. He can't do that with certain things because he's, he's trying to convey impressions. He's trying to convey ideas. He's trying to convey um, uh, feelings. And you can't always put those into words. So he uses other words that don't really make sense when you when you break them down. So he says, this thing was full of the names of blasphemy. Well, what is the name of blasphemy? Is it Nero, Domitian, Bill, Fred, George, Sue? No, I think it's, I think it's sin, wickedness, cruelty, shedding of innocent blood. I think those are the ideas. He just sees this creature who personifies, embodies, full of, embodies, spitting in the face of God. That's how he describes it. Now, back to verse 4. This woman, the Roman Empire, the whore sitting on the, 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 the devil's beast, uh, is covered in colors of, we typically associate with royalty, but also could be colors of bloodshed, and maybe a little both. Purple for royalty, scarlet for blood. Because she is so rich, and she is so wealthy, and she is so powerful on the earth, because... She's willing to get her hands so bloody and do so much evil. She is decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. She's wearing the very, very best gemstones the earth has to offer. She is living at the top of the pyramid. She is the richest, wealthiest, fanciest of them all. She's got gold rings. She's got pearl necklaces. She's got uh, precious stones all over her body. Incidentally, at the end of this book, as we start seeing God's depiction of paradise, or really God's depiction of the glorified church, as he describes it, he uses these same emblems, gold and precious stones and pearls, and he says, that stuff paves the floor. Like you walk on gold. The doorknobs are made of pearls. But here, there, that's, that's the most fancy stuff that she could get. And she wears it. It's so important to her. But for us, the gold that she puts on her rings and her, you know, tiara or whatever, gold for her, which is the most important thing she could ever wear, we walk on that stuff. That's, that's pavement. So a little contrast there, which we'll see later in this book. And in her hand, a golden cup full of abomination and filthiness of her fornication. I think it's curious that the last time we, we saw the Roman Empire, God was shoving the cup of his wrath in her hand. And now when we see her in response, she has a cup of evil in her hand. She hasn't learned her lesson. She's holding a cup full of, in fact, we'll see the blood of the innocent in a moment. Verse 5. Upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And if you did not have that first word, mystery, if you just had Babylon the Great, 
there would be somebody out there, and there probably is anyway, who would say, so we're reading about Babylon. Or, and they would try to, and I've seen it done, they would try to make an application when they'd say, well, this must be the, the nation of Iraq, and that's why we went and invaded them. So we're so thankful that George Bush, you know, uh, did that in 2003 when we invaded Iraq because that's the evil Babylon that Re Revelation was talking about. And I don't even know what you're talking about because that's not at all what John is talking about. That is not at all what he says. He flat out tells you with big flashing neon words, this is the mystery Babylon. Mystery Babylon. What does that mean? It means this is the wink, wink, nudge, nudge, in quotation marks, Babylon. It's not really Babylon. It's the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire is the Babylon of Revelation. John almost never, if not ever, says the word Rome in this book. I don't want to say never because I might have forgotten a part. But I don't think John ever says the word Rome in this book. But you know he's talking about Rome when he talks about the great city or Babylon because that's the connection he wants Christians to make to a great big empire of evil, the mother of harlots and abominations, the, the queen of all sinfulness on earth today. Verse 6. And I saw this woman drunken with the blood of the saints. What's in her cup that she's carrying? The blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. That's what she's carrying. She is feasting on the blood of her enemies. That's a grotesque display, a picture that John is painting. That she is gulping down the blood of innocent people. The martyrs are just those who preached the gospel of Jesus, suffered for it, preached it again anyway, and died for it who were willing to witness to the end who Jesus was. And she's drinking their blood. And John says, when I saw her, the King James says, I wondered with great admiration. Your Bible might say, I wondered marvelously, or I wondered greatly. Literally, it means I wondered with great wonder. I did this. Like John is just awestruck. It's a surreal scene, the spectacle. Imagine, visualize, close your eyes and visualize. This woman covered in a, in a purple robe, decked out in all these jewels and gemstones. She's carrying a, a, a steiner of blood. So she's got blood dripping down her face, and she's riding on a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns. I mean, that is an awesome spectacle. It's not good, but you, you stand in awe when you see it. Now, put yourself in John's shoes as you turn to verse 7, and you're staring up at this beast, and you don't even notice this angel coming up beside you and turning to look at you and saying, come on, that's not that impressive. That's what he says. You, you want to see, see a closer look? I'll show you. It's not that impressive. Yeah, that, that whole thing's going to go crashing down here in just a minute. Verse number 7, the angel said to me, why are you marveling? I'll tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which had seven heads and ten horns. I'll, I'll tell you the secret. It's not much. I'll tell you how the story ends. It's not good for them. Imagine if you were, if you were whisked away, like John is here, if you were whisked away to New York Harbor and to stand on the outside looking at Liberty Island, and there is the great Statue of Liberty, our grand colossus of freedom given to us. And we look at that grand statue, and it's your first time ever seeing something so majestic. And you look at it, and you just marvel, and you're just in awe. And then an angel comes up to you and says, yeah, but if you look on the other side, it's just completely crumbling. It's, and the whole thing, it's full of maggots, and the wood is rotten, and the, 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 the metal is, is rusted. The whole thing's going to collapse. The whole foundation's bad. In six months, this won't even be here. If you heard that, you'd think, oh, well, not that impressive when you put it that way. You know, because it looks good on this side, but you're right. If I look back over here, wow, it really is collapsing. Huh, not that impressive. That's what you see here. He sees this awesome spectacle, and the angel says, come on, come here. I'll show you the mystery. I'll tell you the secret. Verse 8. The beast that you saw was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into the bottomless pit. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Let's take this piece by piece. There's a lot to verse number 8. The beast you saw was and is not. 
Let's contrast that with God, who frequently in this book is called the God that is and was and is to come. So it's like God's got a couple on the devil. Because the devil is just the beast that is. Well, listen, that's nothing. We all is. Everybody is. I is, you is, we all is. God is, the devil is. But not for long. He was, and he is not. Present perfect. He's, a, he's about to stop being. His time is up. And he ascends out of the bottomless pit. He goes into perdition, two different words, but it means the same thing. He goes out of, out of Hades and back into Hades. He goes out of destruction and into destruction. He leaves his domain to come to the earth and goes back to his domain. Like a snake that slithers out of its hole and then slithers back in again. Like the devil in the book of Job, who is described and describes himself as just moving to and fro, just going all about doing my thing. I'm just kind of here and a little bit over there, and I'll go there and I'll come back here. I come out of perdition, I go into perdition. I come out of the pit, I go into the pit. Just working my mischief, doing my evil. And those that dwell on the earth see this beast with seven heads and ten horns, and they marvel at it. They wonder at it. They're in awe of it. And for them, it's the kind of awe that we have for Jesus. Because these people wondering and these people in awe, these are the people whose names are not written in the book of life. These are the people who have hitched their wagon to the devil, who are ride or die with Rome. And they want all the goods, they want all the treats, they want all the fun that the devil can give you until the fun runs out and judgment day comes. But that's for later. They are following the devil. Their names are not written in the book of life. They are not the people of God. Verse 9. And here is the mind that has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. What? What? This beast suddenly is a mountain range? Seven heads are seven mountains? Notice, not the body of the beast. The body of the beast is separate from the heads of the beast. We'll see that next week. But the heads of the beast are now, now depicted for us as seven mountains. It should be noted that Rome is the empire built on seven hills. That's what it was called. A connection, I think, is obvious to be made to the Roman Empire. Seven heads are seven mountains, and the woman sits on them. But wait, I thought the woman was Rome. Mixing metaphor, combining thoughts and ideas to describe the empire that we're looking at here. The seven hills, by the way, uh, Aventine, Callian, uh, Capitoline, that's where we get the word capital, Esquiline, Palatine, um, Quirinial, and Viminial. Not that that matters, but those are your seven hills of Rome. And that's what John sees. He sees Rome, and he sees a spectacle that the evil of the world are in awe of, unaware that its whole foundation is collapsing, and it's all going to be destroyed by God very shortly. Verse 10, and this is where things get really crazy. It's the last verse. And there are seven kings. You have seven heads, seven mountains, seven kings. Five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short space. Easily one of the most difficult verses of the text. Easily one of those verses that is, there, there are a thousand um, different interpretations of it, and it is just full of mystery. But I would like us, before we zoom in, to just remember the overall point that being made. And let's remember that Revelation was not written verse by verse. Revelation was written as a letter. It was written as one big picture. It was written as a forest. And the temptation and the, the challenge that Bible students sometimes have is to zoom in on that forest and try to overanalyze one of the trees. And you miss the whole big picture. The whole big picture is look at this creature, look at this beast that John, through different ways, describes that it's the Roman Empire. Doubles and triples and quadruples down so that you can know what we're looking at here is the Roman Empire. And so as you do that, remember, you're reading about an empire, and you're reading about it without it ever being named. And so it has to be alluded to in different ways. And so it has seven heads, it has seven mountains, it has seven kings. It's all part of the same big picture, okay? Nevertheless, 
there is an interpretation. There must be an interpretation. Now, I may not have it right, but here's my interpretation of what it means. Again, the text, verse number 10. Seven kings, five are fallen, one is, one is not yet come. What, are that, what is that talking about? Seven kings of the Roman Empire, very obviously, I think, makes reference to emperors of the Roman Empire. But it should be noted that there are 11 emperors in Roman history at this point. 11 people have worn the mantle of Caesar or emperor by this point when John wrote Revelation. They are Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, Nero, Galba, Otho, Vitellius, Vespasian, Titus, and Domitian. Those 11 men were the emperors of Rome. 11 is not 7, so you can't do that. You can't say he's just listing the seven emperors. That wouldn't make sense anyway because of the descriptions he gives you. And that's the thing about this. As we said with those tribes and as we said with Armageddon, it's, it's not so cut and dry, translate one to one, seven emperors, seven heads, seven mountains, seven kings, because there's not seven emperors. There's 11 emperors. And if you read commentaries and scholars and people who write about it, what they'll try to do is they'll, they'll, just, they'll force that idea that seven emperors in history of Rome, and even though there have been 11, they must be those seven, and we'll just combine some. And so we'll combine Augustus and Tiberius, and we'll combine Caligula and uh, Claudius. Well, why are you combining them? John didn't tell you to combine them. John didn't say to do that. See, now, now you're injecting your interpretation into the text instead of seeing it as the way to understand what the text is giving you. Proper interpretation is taking what the text gives you and making sense of it. But once you take your interpretation before the text and you shove it into the text, that's, that's not good exegesis. That's not good drawing out. That's shoving in. And we shouldn't do that. So I, I always push back whenever I read a commentator saying, well, these represent the emperors of Rome in history if you combine these here and combine these there. Well, that's a big if. John didn't do that. There must be something else. And notice also, by the way, that John doesn't just tell you how many. He gives you another important modifier to understand how to understand them. He says, five have been, one is, and one's to come. Five, one, one. There's your seven. Notice, it's not seven. It's three. It's not seven. It's three. And if you take what's, com what's all in those three, you get seven parts. But it's three things. Five that, is, that, that were, five that are dead, five that are fallen. That's one of those three. One that still is, that's another one, and one that is to come. There are three groups. Five are in this group, one is in this group, and one's in this group. That makes seven, but there are three groups. Five that wa were, one that is, and one's to come. Look at that list of emperors again. Augustus, Tiberius, Augustus, Tiberius, Cal Caligula, Claudius, Nero. Stop. Five. These are the five that are fallen. Why are they fallen? Because after Nero, remember, we talked about this a few weeks ago, Nero had a coup made against him. Galba orchestrated a coup. And General, um, the Gauls, the Gauls and, and Galba orchestrated a coup against him. And so Nero was either killed or he was mortally wounded and exiled and he fled to the east. Either way, his dynasty, that dynasty of the sea, ended with Nero. So those five, that dynasty that began with Augustus, the great nephew, I think, of Julius Caesar, when that Nero was, was um, overthrown, that dynasty ended. Now that's the five that were. Now you have, after Nero, Galba, who orchestrated the coup. He started a new dynasty, Galba. Otho, Vitellius, Vespasian, Titus, Domitian. Those six are the dynasty that is. That's the one that is. Now you say, wait, why is that the one that is and those are five that were? Because that's a dead dynasty. And so it doesn't get the, the, the prestige that history affords, currently being written history affords, the present power, the present people in power. They are one dynasty. Kings come and kings go, but that's still the one dynasty. But that one that was, you know, it's just a bunch of kings that are gone now. Those are the five that were. But we are the one dynasty that is, the dynasty of Galba, Otho, Vitellius, Vespasian, Titus, and Domitian. 
And it just so happens that Domitian is going to be executed. He's going to be assassinated. And he's going to replace, be replaced by Nerva. Nerva begins a new dynasty, the one that is to come. So you have five that were, you have one that is, and one that is to come. And because Rome is going down, that one that is to come is described as passing shortly. It's not going to last very long. Don't think of that in terms of, well, how many years did it last? No, don't make it so literal. Don't make it so earthly. It's just from the standpoint of God, he looks at the Roman Empire, and he sees this beast with seven heads. And he says five of these heads represent the emperors that have been. One represents the emperors that, that are the dynasty in power now. And one represents the emperor that is yet to come, the dynasty yet to come. But that whole beast is going down. Because as we'll see next week, there is actually an eighth head that controls all the others. The real head of this whole beast. The controlling force of this whole evil creation. And you probably know, it's, it's the devil himself. So you have these seven beasts, and you, you think you can kill one. It was and is and was not and is again. That's the way it's described like that. You, you kill it, and it comes back, and you kill it, and it comes back. Imagine what, be, what, what being a Christian was like during the reign of these Caesars. One Caesar would die, and that's not to say that you rejoice over their death necessarily, but probably there was a lot of sighing of relief when the latest emperor of evil dies. Maybe the Christians thought, Whew, maybe the next one will be nicer. And then the next one rises, and he's just as bad, not worse. So you cannot kill these beasts, it seems like. No matter what you do, you chop off a head, and there's another head. You chop off a head, there's another head. It's this beast with infinite heads, seven heads, and all this power, ten horns. But God is saying there's an eighth head that controls the rest. If we take care of that, you don't have to worry about it. And that eighth head is the devil. And as we move into the end of Revelation, the devil is going to be vanquished forevermore. And you won't have to worry about Rome or whatever comes after Rome. You won't have to worry about evil or sin or temptation or death. Because after all this is gone, it'll just be you and God forevermore. But I'm getting ahead of myself. That's Revelation chapter 17, starting or stopping in verse 10. We'll pick up next week with Revelation 17, 11, and read a little bit more, learn a little bit more about this beast and its heads and how this eighth head is described and comes into play. That's all I have for you tonight. Thank you all very much.